this is Emu Chicken. So this is the Bitfunks Amiga CD32 joystick adapter. In our Amiga USB adapter video, we found that this one was pretty damn fast, but only one input was working. We are going to fix some of these problems. Using a micro USB to USB-A cable, we hook it up to the pooter. We can see only one input is available. To add another, we're going to go to this Demon Byte GitHub page and find this entry down here, Sega 2 controllers. Within here, there's a lot of information. There's parts you need if you want to make one, wiring diagrams, etc. We will need to download these, which are the firmware files. First thing we'll do is click the top one, go to raw, click that, then right click in the center of this page, save as, and then save it to a folder of your choice. We'll need to remove this .txt, and then press save. Press back a couple of times, then repeat the process for each file. That is pretty tedious. It's like watching Star Wars, a movie about robots in sand. Wom 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 pisha zap zap. Now we have the firmware files in one folder. Yeah. Now to download Arduino IDE software. Select the OS you're using and then install it. This tool is needed to upload the firmware to our board. So open this .ino file and then we'll be given an error. Press OK. This will create the proper folder name we need. Now place all of the other files into this folder. Now in the Arduino software, we need to press on Tools, go to Board, and then Board Manager. In the search box at the top, we'll need to type Spark Fun, and then look for Spark Fun AVR Boards. There it is. Click that, and at the bottom right, it should say Install. I have mine already installed, so should be no problem here. Close this window, and from the top, we go to Tools, Board, Sparkfun AVR Boards, and make sure Pro Micro is selected. In Processor, 5V, 60MHz, and import the bottom one. If it's not here, you may need to open up the tool as administrator. Arduino as ISP should be selected here, and we should be good to go. Now press on the upload button and wait. I'll turn the kettle. Oh. <laughs> yes, go turn the kettle on. So at the bottom, it should say uploading and then done uploading. Now we can see there are two controllers detected. Getting them working, however, is another story altogether. If we check out the images for the pinouts, they are slightly different. Okay, completely different. Um, it's time for some soldering. We have pretty much everything we need here, including burnt pancake. These diagrams are different. There's a slight variation on even the directional inputs. So with the Stanley knife, we'll cut some traces. The traces are these lines that go along the board that connect the pins to each controller. We can use a multimeter with the continuity checker to make sure we've completely broke the connection. We can then do this with every trace of the board. I see you are not using any shortcut. That is cutting it. Now to ready some 24 gauge wire. Snip it and strip it. We use flux on everything we want to solder. This helps the solder stick. We'll add some solder to the board pins, tin the cables and then attach them. Player 1 directions are in red, and the fire buttons are in yellow. And for player 2, I'm going to use blue cable for the directions, and green cable for the fire buttons. Time for a test. Let's see if this works. In the first port, we have an Amiga joystick, and it looks like it's working fine. The standard 3-button Mega Drive pad, however, is all over the place. To fix this, we'll add a couple more cables. 
First we'll add ground. We'll also add one more for pin 7. The Amiga joystick does not need this, but hey, see what happens. And here's the Mega Drive pad. And it looks fine. 1, 2, 3, and 7. After verifying this works with the Amiga controller, we can do this for both ports. As we won't use this for anything but USB, we can bridge J1. This will now run at steady 5 volts. Amiga and Mega Drive controllers now work on both ports. To prevent shorting, we can use a piece of plastic underneath. Then add a bit of protection with a professional looking case. We will now use a layer of black plastic. If you wish, you can also use a layer of primer. This will help the plastic stick. Make sure to not leave any gaps. And when you do apply this, make sure you use long strokes from a distance. To protect the processor and keep it cool, we need to create a bridge. We can use some black insulation tape and then secure it to our board. There seems to be some brown showing. We'll need to give it a layer of black. This looks like my pajamas. The ones are made from a black bin bag. And now for the finishing touches, we can cover the board entirely. Now this looks Incredible. To add a logo, fit for a king, King George. We know this works in Windows, but we'll need to get it working in RetroArch too. Using RetroBat, we'll configure the controls. Everything we cannot set, we'll try and skip. And then we'll need to edit the esinput.config and change the hotkey ID to eight. And there we have it. We've successfully converted the Bitfunks Amiga CD32 adapter to a Mega Drive one. Both ports are now working, and it also has an awesome case. Lastly, here's a big thank you to all of those on our Patreon. We create reviews, tutorials, and also open up the Pandora boxes, as well as hack into the A500 minis. If you'd like to support our work, please check our Patreon page, or a simple like, subscribe, would be fabulous. Indeed, I don't really think that you can top a video where you completely destroy a perfectly fine USB adapter and wrap it up in a bin bag. Yeah, it's fine.